and we'll talk about it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, well, Cecilia, you should tell the story about how you were trying to create a, uh, what was it? It was an American Academy of Science report. Like it, all the countries in the Americas were trying to come together and create some report on climate change, but uh, there was a lot of drama about people not agreeing about things. Do you remember this story you told me once? Nope. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember but the I, name of the report. I'm sure you would. But I recently did. I can send you the link because they recently did each of the divisions of the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe, wrote mm -hmm. their own climate and health paper. Mm -hmm. And then they combined it into a common, huge, huge, like 190 pages. And I just got the links. I, I participated in both. One as a... As a former I mean, as an author and another as a reviewer for mm. the region of the international one so they're very very interesting and uh, very 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 diverse i mean they touch everything that you can imagine mm -hmm. with regard to climate and with regard to health you know um, oh very cool yeah you should circulate it would be so great to so i'll send that to you after this yeah. meeting thanks so so I know we'll start to have people trickle in. Um, Lisa, thanks for setting everything up and for pushing record. It seems like we're doing great. Um, so I could start with a bit of introduction of Cecilia, and then um, and then Cecilia, you could you could take it away with your talk. How's that? So I'll start with an introduction. So Cecilia Conde is a researcher at the Institute of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate Change at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, in Mexico City. Um, and so Cecilia has a long history of working on climate change. She was the general coordinator for adaptation to climate change under the former Mexican government from 2013 to 2017. She has um, been a lead author, author for three IPCC reports. So that's how I met Cecilia. We were mm -hmm. co-authors of the same chapter of the last IPCC report on adaptation, which was obviously the best chapter in the report. Everyone should read it. Um, and so Cecilia has experience in academia and policy about climate change. <clears throat> She's worked on climate change scenarios and potential impacts and is really working on adaptation. How do we adapt to climate change? And um, so Cecilia's background is in physics. She studied physics. Yes. And uh, what was funny to me is that I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to tell you that because she's done so many different things across so many different disciplines. And I know she'll talk about that today, um, but including working with farmers and indigenous people to understand climate impacts and adaptation. So it's we're really um, delighted to have you with us, Cecilia. Thank you so much for joining and I'll turn it over to you. We have an hour, so normally we'll let you present and take it away and then we can have questions at the end um, or if you'd like to invite questions at different points, you're welcome to do so. Um, but okay. people, if anyone has questions while she's speaking, you can put them in the chat for now. All right, yes. over to you, Cecilia. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, you tell me, can can you see that? Yeah, it's, uh, yes, exactly. We can see the slides. It's not yet in, yet. Yeah, perfect. All right, okay. go ahead. So that's the title of my chat. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm eager to discuss with you and all the students. This thing I say, this phrase I say to my students and in my conferences, climate change, we need politically relevant science and scientifically grounded policies. And I have some examples that I have, I have lived, shared and suffered in Mexico. So I, I hope it will be short enough so, so I, we can discuss the ideas. It's just, it's not a really a strictly an academic presentation. It's some ideas I want to share with you and discuss. So the first concept uh, I want to discuss with you, the, what's in the base of my current research is that climate justice. I think global warming is mainly an ethical and a political problem, and not only a physical, where I come from, <laughs> atmospheric physics, or an environmental problem. So we need to make interactions more, strong interactions between science and policy uh, that considers e equality, human rights, collect collective rights. So we need more participation of scientists, 
for those that uh, uh, planetary limits that rocks from another researchers uh, address or pointed out it's climate change but also the loss of biodiversity and the loss of uh, soil fertility and we urgently need to involve social scientists because global warming is an ethical and a political problem and we don't study that in mainly in atmospheric physics so who uh, claim for uh, climate justice you can see the participations of youth ngos uh, in the conference of the parties this is in glasgow so they claim first they demand climate justice as their first demand climate education physical and mental health mental health is something that i didn't track before but i have discussed with my students uh, especially during and after the pandemic and to follow up what the country's commitments are the, in the national determined determined contributions of course women also claim climate justice uh, indigenous people claim also climate justice farmers etc so climate justice is something that is in the people that are fighting uh, climate change why are we uh, in the conditions we are considering climate change you can see at the left that china of course has increased its emissions as a country uh, more than double that the ones from the united states but if we consider per capita emissions you can see uh, even though the trend in the united states is decreasing you need almost two chinese people to emit what one person in the united states emit and more uh, um, striking is considering the income of the people uh, income of uh, groups the top richest people the top one percent income er earners emit almost 70 percent more than the 50 percent the poorest this of course is a huge inequality that strikingly it increases with crisis perhaps you can see have seen some uh, figures like this but this this is not COVID-19 this is previous pandemic uh, events such as SARS H1N1 uh, Ebola and so so the richest the top richest people in the world became richer <laughs> so as COVID and the, the poorest people became poor and that is a very bad sign if we consider a future climate crisis or the climate crisis we are undergoing. So, of course, there are other sources of vulnerability, not only rich and poor, but also gender, ethnicity, age, race, and disability. This, of course, there's no logic or justice to uh, that fundament these inequalities but all these people, and we are the majority, if I consider my gender, my age, my ethnicity or race, that reduces the capacities and opportunities to face climate change. So I want to put that as a background to understand why I think we need to consider climate justice as the keystone to, to fight climate change. Considering my personal history, how I have related to the govern Mexican government and science, I participated since 1997. Perhaps most of you have not been born. <laughs> I don't know. But I made the first, I, I, I was in the team that constructed the first climate change scenarios in 1997. Mexico has six uh, national communications. And now I'm looking at observed and projected uh, climate change scenarios considering the last uh, results from working group one uh, and also since then since 1997 i was involved in agriculture models to assess potential impacts in maize mainly but now I've, we've done a lot of crops, uh, water availability, biodiversity, and soils. 
So this this mainly is a, a very strict and uh, uh, research done by experts, and I've been included and learned a lot. Currently, we are uh, discussing agriculture, as I show you some examples and cities. And yes, we have uh, tried to uh, implement some adaptation actions in some states, Tlaxcala and Puebla, which are, are in the center. This is the Gulf of Mexico, Veracruz. And currently, we are risking ourselves to try to implement some actions, considering also mitigation, how to reduce emissions when you, especially in the agricultural sector. So this is considering the uh, science and interdisciplinarity issues, this is a great challenge. There's a lot of climatic scientists, climate scientists that don't want to risk, risk themselves to interact with these experts in agriculture and water and so on. And there are a lot of experts here that uh, don't want to introduce climate change scenarios or discuss climate change. Uh, more risky is to <laughs> include, <coughs> I'm sorry, social scientists, because we don't have a common language. We have to bridge knowledge to, to construct interdisciplinarity. And there's a lot of social scientists that refuses to interact with us say there's another more important things like politics, poverty, whatever, instead of this. So it's difficult to construct this new kind of knowledge. Skipping to adaptation directly, I've worked with maize producers in Tlaxcala, coffee producers in Puebla, women, especially in Puebla and with vegetables. And now we are uh, working in agriculture and Puebla city. <coughs> now, there's problems uh, and risks. If you uh, implement adaptation actions, perhaps you're not regarding equity because sometimes those adaptations are valid or useful for some or perhaps none. And you have to consider the knowledge, the people, the stakeholders, key farmers that uh, have their own knowledge uh, constructed in hundreds of years those sense of years. So, and the risk, of course, is sometimes you have money to do an adaptation project. The money has ended. So no more, no money, no more adaptation. So I usually say that hell is paved with good intentions or hell is, can be paved with adaptation actions that you <laughs> leave, you don't finish them and you create, you might create a conflict with because people have let's say part of an infrastructure so to whom that infrastructure belongs and of course the high level of uh, um, success would be if stakeholder stakeholders appropriate those ac actions and they they can follow it and preserve those adaptation actions considering now my political angle I was general coordinator of adaptation to climate change in this period. That's from uh, National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change of the Minister of, of Environment. And I participated in the conference of the parties, which is countries participating in, in, in the UNFCCC. I participated in Lima and especially the Paris Agreement. Here I learned a lot in the Paris Agreement. And then other meetings. Uh, the topics in which I participated as a delegate was adaptation, of course, since, since I was the general coordination, loss and damage, which is a very interesting issue. That's Article 8 of the Paris Agreement, capacity building, and gender. We could introduce the discussion of gender in adaptation, in capacity building. Um, uh, Mexico. As a country, we also, as a de delegation, we also consider that adaptation should be a global goal. There was a discussion if it's one of, it's going to be a vision or a goal. So we struggle and many countries want that it should be a goal. And of course we wanted that explicitly the Paris Agreement stated 
we wanted to reduce our current vulnerability and we include the gender perspective. This is the Mexican language gender responsive. We won in Lima, we were uh, declared as champions of gender in the uh, uh, global negotiations. We couldn't win, we lost to have human rights in the articles. You can find human rights only in the preamble of the Paris Agreement, but human rights, we lost that one. And of course, we have to consider vulnerable groups, communities, and ecosystems. Uh, we, uh, we think the best possible science should be used and be available to everyone as an open science. And the knowledge of indigenous people should be considered for uh, adaptation actions. Mexico also uh, pushed strongly to have uh, climate services included in the, in the Paris Agreement, uh, particularly early warning systems. We think that uh, science has, is, is, is having this process of privatization. And we think science should be open and, uh, and be access accessible to everyone, including, of course, developing countries. Uh, so I'm going to show you two, two examples of, of uh, where we are working, indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. How can we bridge that one? And two mm, small examples of early warning systems in agriculture. And now we are working on cities. Uh, another very important uh, project that uh, we are doing is these natural-based solutions. We have worked for almost two years with uh, coffee producers in Veracruz, lo uh, looking at co-benefits between mitigation and adaptation. That is, yes, we look how could they manage coffee plants uh, better, but also how can they mitigate with those actions, especially how they manage soils. And this is a uh, project we will start this year, it's called Pocket Parks, small parks in the city. Uh, so I, uh, this is interesting, very interesting for me. We have to involve citizens, uh, but I, uh, and we hope we can achieve that working with the government and with citizens. Just to make some emphasis on indigenous and community knowledge, where in the world where you find the uh, most uh, forest biomes, the biggest forest, you also find the indigenous communities there. So th they protect the forest and you can uh, see how many uh, indigenous uh, uh, communities in 64 countries can store this uh, enormous amount of carbon. You can find that in this very interesting paper. Um, and that's part of Mexico. Mexico has two huge richness. It's one of the few countries that has a great a high degree of cultural diversity. This is counted more than 60 languages that are spoken in Mexico. We have 83 uh, languages and, and, and some der derivatives of that. And we are a mega diverse country. So those two richness must be considered if we want to discuss adaptation. Uh, you might, we don't know how much money can we lose if we lose all these languages, but we think following the loss and damage uh, article that we will have high non-economic losses if we lose, lose these two richness. So we think any adaptation action should be designed considering this too high diversity in language and in biodiversity to preserve it. Of course, we could lose both and we could lose, we will still be called Mexico, but perhaps we have lost most of our identity. This is an example. We made the water cycle and we put it in this infogram especially three researchers from the Mexi Mexican Physical Society. And we work with the National Institute of Indigenous Languages, 
uh, with some students from the Faculty of Science. So we translate this to these languages and then translate it again to Spanish to see uh, if the con concepts were right and what can we learn of the concepts of what's water, what's rain, and so on. This is a translation to Tenek. We're going to take that this infogram to basic um, junior schools that, uh, in these regions to see what uh, what's the reaction and what do uh, the way do they later uh, need from us, from the Mexican physical of society. The second example I want to discuss with you is this early warning systems. These are the uh, elements that early warning si systems must include, must include. And we think that communication and dissemination of the warnings and community responses capabilities are the weaker parts or wings of the uh, early warning system. So I'm going to show you two examples. During the strong El Nino event, we could deliver, uh, I think, a uh, very important forecast for Tlaxcala maize producers. And in Puebla, uh, if we consider the weakening of the polar vortex and what threat that represents for the vegetable producers in, in Puebla. So yes, agriculture is a risky activity, but farmers are, or campesinos are currently struggling with unexpected extreme events. So we think we could uh, uh, increase their uh, adaptive capacity if we use co-production co of low knowledge between different disciplines and between the local and ind indigenous knowledge. So we want to enhance, en enhance adaptive capacities based on potential and new knowledge and shared knowledge. Of course, we use participatory methods, especially when we don't have uh, enough uh, data, meteorological or research uh, done on the field. And this is uh, one example. We have this uh, image of the, of the region and we put a transparent and paper on the top and they start drawing. This is the most uh, important region for us. Here we plant, this is a river, this is fauna, flora, whatever. So we start discussing spatial and temporal, temporal information that it's key for us. So we collected the historical effects in Tlaxcala of a Nino event, and we uh, designed some proposals for, to, for adaptation. In the case of Puebla, we have 18 weather stations and a network, and we have one meteorolog meteorological station in a key stakeholder called Don Concho, Concepcion Colotla. Uh, he's a great leader of a, of a campesinos organization called Zapata Leaves, Zapata Vive, and, and, and he's very respected, and he has interchanged knowledge and, uh, uh, and, and work with the University of Puebla with my colleagues. So we found out that the weakening of the polar vortex can affect the, the uh, agriculture in the region. So we collected that, lab, that, that data and tried to um, uh, start constructing an early warning system for that. This is the case of Tlaxcala. This is how usually it rains, the red one. So in very strong El Nino events, you can see that the rain starts normally and then it drops. So this is one kind of uh, uh, drought. And in the second year of El Nino event, there's a delay in, in, in the beginning of the rainy season. So we arrive here, 1998, and give them a forecast which for us, it was a very good forecast. No, we, we knew that the rain would exactly behave this way. Uh, we propose, and they believe us. That's important. They believe us. So, and discussing with them, we learned that they have some popular sayings like, uh, 
flowery March last year, so they don't have a lot of confidence if the rain starts here. They believe a lot in the April rains, April rains, thousand rains. And even if after June, there's a, a, a lot of rain, they don't uh, have confidence in planting because they could uh, find early frost or the market uh, conditions is different. So they have this saying, what San Juan does not see born, San Pedro consider it's lost. That's San, San John and San Peter. So because there's the festivities these days in June. So, of course, we have this model. That's why we call it uh, potential impacts. We have the climate uh, data from very strong Ninos since 65. And we know that, that the yields will decrease and the stage of grain filling uh, would be also decrease. So what they, they say in 1998, they believe the forecast, eh? so they they decided and to purchase fodder, uh, uh, oats for fodder, uh, so they can gain something. That was a very important action. And we also decided to, to construct, to build some small backyard greenhouses. This is an example. Uh, this is the farmer, his grandson, this is I, 1998. Interesting enough, we have the money, the budget, the intention to construct five green small houses. Uh, but uh, in one case, I remember the farmer has a special religion where women could not be involved. So we couldn't construct that one because it, it's in, in, their, in their backyard and we wouldn't have to to uh, possess also the, the, the greenhouse. So that was a failure. It was not a failure of infrastructure. The, how can you construct a greenhouse? It was a failure because we didn't consider those social uh, and cultural problems. So that was a great lesson for me. I failed, but I learned. <laughs> and in Puebla, we know for many years, hundreds of years, people have uh, fought with uh, frost events. They even select the varieties of the seeds, considering their frost resistance. During the, the event, they know what to do. And after the event, they can plant again. Of course, they lost uh, money there. So when I, I arrived in a sabbatic uh, uh, research time, they told me that they didn't have this black frost uh, since the last 20 years. But in December uh, 2017 and 18, and, and the winter in January and February 2018, they suffered this black frost. Black frost burst the cells of all the plants. So you can see the field completely black because plants have died, died. And yes, there were this weakening of the polar vortex that affected the center of Mexico. You can see the jet stream here that advances uh, since the polar region to the center of Mexico. And we have this uh, atmospheric condition that uh, uh, Cost the color to a subsidence of cold air that frosts the 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 cultivars in Puebla. So we think it's associated, of course, in a abrupt descent of uh, minimum temperatures below five degrees, and so we think this is Don Concho uh, that has a station in his house. So he's. Seeing in real time what's the, the values for minimum temperature, humidity, and and a wind speed, which is very low. Uh, so researchers and students, we think, can uh, analyze if the polar vortex is weakening, and then Con Concho and the researchers can follow this 
to have a, to be to start constructing an, an early warning system and of course we could tell all the, all the farmers in the some conscious organizations and use the community radio also interesting enough we met with uh, and i interact with these women in this project green project for the empowerment of women in rural communities in puebla and tlaxcala they did this uh, uh, compost biofertilizers and so on and they start producing more and better vegetables they were very happy by the way and they and they suddenly suffer this black frost of course they recover more quickly than other producers but uh, we think that we must include uh, not only the local uh, information of climate and we we have to con uh, consider this uh, uh, major scale uh, meso scale or global scale events like el nino or the weakening of the polar vortex to construct an early warning system considering that we we need to go explorate and co-design the process and we can disseminate it collectively of course we need the farmers organizations and willingness and trust to to do that so local adaptation is very important well but we have to see the regional and global, global climate surprises as we might call them so interdisciplinary and interinstitutional research is critical to increase adaptive capacity amongst researchers students and farmers we don't know we have to learn what they know what are the actions that they take in this so during these surprises and see if we can systematically construct new knowledge so that's my presentation thank you very much I, okay, thank you so much Cecilia <clears throat> amazing figure out a clapping emoji yeah exactly oops no raise hands um uh, thank you thank you <laughs> claps claps <laughs> thank you very much oh there we go i lost you for a second um thank you so much for this i mean what a diversity of ideas and topics everything from loss and damage from the point of view of mexico to really how do we do early warning systems in one place co-created with people. I mean, very interesting. Um, so now would be a great moment to ask questions. And Noel, it seems like you're ready to kick us off. So other people just put your hand up and then you'll be in line for future questions. Go ahead, Noel. You are on mute. Am I off mute? No, no, now we hear you, yes. Good. What I, I wanted to thank uh, both you and Aaron for this opportunity. And my comment has to do with the degree to which you seem to freely and enthusiastically embrace adaptation as your major field of the address of the climate change. Mm -hmm. Most climate scientists are all into mitigation, like a macho thing, we're gonna stop it. Therefore, we don't have to get used to it or combat its bad effects, but you seem to embrace it with this tremendous diversity of ideas. And I really appreciate it just because of its diversity. But within that, I wanna talk about justice, climate justice, you use the term. Justice mm -hmm. is not a scientific derivative, it's a value. And how do we, how should I convince the victims, the indigenous people of Guatemala and Mexico, of the need for them to take all these measures for adaptation when indeed it's not their minor fault that the climate uh, crisis is upon them. Yes, but well, that's important. I, I think indigenous people, local people, women, don't see this, uh, emission uh, how, how much they emit and if they are guilty or not of the circumstances they live in they want uh, action and to solve a very acute problem they say climate is changing they have no idea where it's going to 
go. So we have to construct a new knowledge. So I agree that it's not their fault, even though we use a common, uh, uh, there's a phrase in, in the UNFCC, uh, uh, responsabilidades comunes, pero diferenciadas, common responsibilities, but differentiate, differentiate actions. But I think they, they don't have uh, this uh, global um, speech in their minds. They want their solutions. And I, I think they are very aware of unfairness, uh, considering the losing their lands, their territories, not land, not water, it's the territory and the culture. So I think we we can consider that in, in the design of adaptation actions. And it, when we were discussing Article 7, that's, uh, 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 there's a, a phrase say, uh, if we meet, mitigate enough, then we won't, won't need adaptation. And I remember I said, and vice versa. <laughs> it was a scandal. <laughs> they even call the chief of my delegation and say, Cecilia should, read, should not include that one. But I think if we lose the ocean, the Amazon, all the forest, then we won't care about if we have an ele electric car or not. I think we will uh, have the danger of abrupt climate change if we don't preserve our forest, if we don't preserve our oceans and so forth. So I, I sustained, well, I, I didn't, I couldn't sustain it. We have to retract that, that phrase, but I still think it's vice versa. If we don't adapt uh, uh, quickly enough, then uh, we will, it doesn't matter if we decrease the emissions of uh, oil or we change for electricity or, uh, for electricity cars and so forth. So we are in danger because the brutal loss of biodiversity. That's that's my that's what I think. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. So we have other questions. People can feel free to put it in the chat or raise their hand. Um, can I kick off one about loss and damage? Yeah. Uh, I think loss and damage is hard to conceptualize. I struggle. What does mm -hmm. this mean? What is this going to mean? Um, the idea is that, you know, we can try to stop climate change through mitigation. We can also try to adapt to climate change through adaptation. But at the end, there are going to be losses and damages. We're not going, you know, we haven't done enough in either category. And mm -hmm. um, so, but what does that look like? What is, what is it? What, what do you think this should look like? It should, should loss and damage be tackled generally by encouraging more adaptation or, or should it be a compensation related mechanism? I know there are a lot of hot debates about this at the moment, but it would be interesting to get your take. Yes, well, to recall the Paris Agreement negotiation, loss and damage, loss and damage was attached to adaptation. So many countries, including mine, decided to have two different articles because we think adaptation is like a prevention and a loss and damage is afterwards. And the problem with loss and damage is you have to prove that a cyclone or, or whatever, a, a great flood or whatever is caused by climate change. And I think we don't have enough signs to make that demonstration. In any case, uh, loss and damage is uh, a very important, it has other, like I, I, I mentioned, the non-economic losses, it's very important to bring them forward because people think, uh, yes, we are going to, as I put my example, we are going to lose our, all our indigenous languages, but that will not cost a dime, let's say. But no, we are, losing our identity, our dignity, even our dignity. No? If you, if you uh, lose uh, your biodiversity. Also, I think the uh, global negotiations are so weak that the last COP, if you recall, uh, agrees to have 
to have the idea, the promise that we'll, there will be money for loss and damage. But I think we, we didn't increase our ambition in mitigation. We didn't uh, um, really understand where in adaptation are we going collectively or nationally. So this agreement, if you see the, have, have you seen the results of the last COP, you will see loss and damage was a promise. There will be money for loss and damage. But I think there's not enough money if we don't mitigate and adapt. There will be no enough money and willingness to give that money for loss and damage. So that's what I think. Thanks, Cecilia. I Thank you, Erin, for the question. Yeah. <laughs> Other comments, questions? I'm sure I, I see, Larissa, you put something really interesting in the chat. Do you want to open? Yeah. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Um, yes. Really amazing presentation, as others said. It, you span so much. And something early on caught my attention. It's, it's not so much a question, just a comment that um, there's this really neat workshop that's based on... Um, um, an interactive model of climate change. And it speaks to your point about having people who sort of speak different languages or who are in different sectors speaking to each other and building will to do something together. Um, and it makes the science a little bit more accessible because it becomes a bit of a game to understand. Like it, it's presented in a bit of a game so that mm -hmm. people take on different um, perspectives and they try to work together to actually reach their goal of, of less than two degrees. Mm -hmm. Warming. I think Aaron, you might actually use it in your class. Um, and it was just a really neat, it's a really neat example of a group that's trying to get people to be rooted in the science, um, but also build empathy and build collective will to, to take action. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to bring it up. And, and it's been translated into lots of different languages. And there's a whole um, program in place so that people can become sort of ambassadors and run these workshops in, in settings all over in different kinds of settings. Oh, yes, that would be very interesting, Erin. Yeah, I think that combination of like the, the head, you know, like understanding the science, but the heart to do something about it is, is really yes. a place where you get, get change. Yes, yes, they're very important instruments. I think we have studied this in the focal groups and what can we do and how can make all the people in the fo focal group talk because sometimes we, between farmers, women usually don't want to talk. So you have to struggle and see some techniques to make them uh, talk. Yes, but it's very, very important to construct a common language and confidence, I think. So I will be very glad to, to see this, this Erin, if you can share it with me, please. <laughs> Excellent, I will. Um... I'm happy to come up with infinite questions. So those, if anybody else wants to jump in, please feel free. Um, my next question for you would be about, in a related way, you've done crop modeling, um, which I think yes. really brings the, the physics of the atmosphere down to earth. Um, mm -hmm. But from what I've seen, it's sometimes hard. Yeah, it's hard to navigate. So the world of CMIP-6 is you know, very well organized. We compare our climate models and we have standards for how what, what kind of runs we're gonna do and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And crop modeling is a little bit all over the place with everybody doing all sorts of different things. And um, mm -hmm. so I'm curious if you would give recommendations for, yeah, that, that area of research, where would you recommend it go and, and structure itself and how could it better inform planning? Um, crop modeling and in particular, the effects of climate change on crops? Yes, well, uh, crop models for developing countries is uh, sometimes translated as a software you, sh you should buy or get and run that model to see. That's why I call it potential impacts. So sometimes I tell my students, your research question is not to run a model. Your research question is what are the impacts and what are the results and what is the perception and so forth. Because uh, uh, I think I use the, this sentence, you get garbage in, garbage out. No? You don't have enough data 
you don't have enough knowledge, but you run a model and say this is based on the most uh, uh, um, scientific model or whatever. So in the first national communication, we did this country study um, research and every coffee break, uh, uh, guys that uh, wanted their model to be used arrived and told us this is for agriculture, this is for water, this is for biodiversity and whatever. And we were all developing countries trying to uh, handle those models. We didn't have enough data. So models are quite important. And there's just an experiment to see what if, what if I change uh, planting date? What if, if I change seeds? But you have to be careful, careful with the softwares, let's say, software. So there are methods and there are models. So let's think about a method that might include a model, but not necessarily. That, that would be my advice. That is my advice to my students. Beware of, <laughs> of softwares. <laughs> They're beautiful. You can see yeah. the graphs or whatever, but... <laughs> I agree. Garbage in, garbage out. I love it. And and what would you say, oh, and Park, you can go next, but then can I just ask a follow-up? What would you say are the biggest limitations and gaps that need further research, right? Data that we don't have or or um, that could then be used to better improve our understanding of impacts? Well, there, there's uh, a lot of, of gaps. I think, uh, I think, starting from... Uh, climate change scenarios, I think uh, they are weak in our region, in the tropical regions. So we have to be careful with those outputs. I also think that there's this barrier to making interdisciplinary research, even though everybody talks about it. I, a very good friends of mine, biologists and agronomists say, social science are not science don't be cheated by them or whatever. And I also work with social scientists that hate uh, physical scientists. They really don't want to talk with them. So no, not every scientist willing to cross the bridge to be humble enough and say, I don't know about your area of experience. Let's learn together. So I, I think that's, that's a great gap that nobody tells you. We need, I think we need to be, to start constructing a new idea of science, which I, I hope that young people that are in the, in the meeting can help because we are almost at the end of our career. But I think it's very important to, to, <coughs> to bridge this, uh, and construct new knowledge. I think. Thanks, Cecilia. We were just talking about this, by the way, in a career session yesterday with AFE about how to talk about selling yourself as someone who's worked across disciplines and how to how to say that. But Mark, can I turn it over to you? You yep. had a question. In a way, in a way, my my observation was on the same topic. It was just just as I hear your presentation, it's clear that one of the ways that you communicate across disciplines is with aphorisms. Did, 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 I thought it was so appealing that when you when you talk to farmers about uh, weather change, you've got like a series of aphorisms. When you're summarizing complicated legal principles from uh, a Paris climate negotiation, you've got an aphorism, uh, a, a saying. And the uh -huh. same was true with the, uh, you're, you're explaining about climate modeling. Well, you say it's a <laughs> crop modeling. It's garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> oh, yes. <coughs> I didn't notice, but yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> to, to make me see it. Thank you. <laughs> Very powerful and memorable. <laughs> Um, other thoughts or questions? Yeah, go ahead, Ellen. So thank you very much. And um, the aphorisms you use to describe the local views are aphorisms that I recognize from the 1970s in Oaxaca. So I'm very happy uh, to see that they're 
they're still being used and that they actually have some effective content for, for planning early mm -hmm. warning. But I did want to press you a little bit more on, on, on how you interact with farmers organizations. I mean, you raised the gender issues, but which farmers organizations work with you? How do you contact them? Have they been in contact in past years with Chapingo or Simid or some of these others? And are there ways in which the farmers organizations from Mexico are somehow linked through networks to farmers organizations elsewhere? Because the one of the goals of the UN Food System Summit was to try to activate these different organizations. And even if they weren't participating easily in the summit, at least let them know about each other and continue communication. Yes, yes, it's very important. The first experience we had, we were uh, the farmers organization in Tlaxcala arrived to the university because they want answers. So that's a very nice way to start an adaptation project because farmers request answers that we didn't have, by the way, we didn't have. So we constructed with them that the farmers in Puebla have a long history of fighting against uh, injustice. They wanted to take their lands for, to construct a road and so forth. So they fought with the risk of their lives, by the way, with the university and they won. It's a very strange case, I think. Or, uh, or... So uh, they have a long history of fighting and looking for answers and looking for different ways of uh, doing agriculture. So it was uh, more easy for us to interact with them and to construct the and try to construct these early warning systems. And yes, we have, I have a PhD student in Chapingo and I have a long history with Chapingo and CIMED. And so they taught me a lot. My best student, uh, my PhD student came from Chapingo. He won the, the prize of the best thesis and whatever. So, but I, it's the credit of him, I think. He, he supported me and, and we constructed together this research on agriculture, but also on soils. I think soils is a issue that's little considered and it's very important, very important for forest and for agriculture. So yes, uh, and the network, I think they, I'm not involved in the network of farmers, but I know, uh, for example, coffee producers interact with other organizations of coffee producers from other countries, and they have made their point considering what about Red Plus and uh, organic coffee and so forth. But yes, it's very important, their own organizations and their point of views in the COPs and the general um, global negotiations. Thank you. Ellen. Thank you. Great, thank you. Other thoughts, questions, comments? If not, I think we could probably close the talk. Oh, go ahead, Larissa, were you gonna say something? Go ahead. Yeah. One more question. Um, I don't know a lot about this area, so I'm wondering how much sort of the social infrastructure types of strategies. So empowering indigenous communities who are already protecting forests, for example, how how much is that considered at sort of these negotiations and, and what's the pitch? And are, are these able to be sort of quantified at the same terms, in the same terms as, as some other kind of strategies? Um, and a follow-up to that is, are there opportunities to understand those kind of strategies more so that they are more readily available as um, on that negotiating table. That makes sense. Well, the if uh, you see the the conference of the parties negotiations when NGOs uh, from indigenous uh, organizations or youth or women start to talk, everybody go out. <laughs> I have these photos that <laughs> the delegates really don't hear that's that's what they talk about among them and they constructing different kinds of network but i have 
in, in my classes, I, I see this is the negotiation of Article 1, and this is when the NGOs start to talk. So you can see the, uh, well, there's, they, are, they are fighting, but it's difficult to say uh, the, the impact they have on several de delegates. I, I was astonished, for example, when we couldn't include human rights in, in the article of adaptation. For me, that I couldn't believe it, but I'm from the physical science. So I think perhaps there were other kind of negotiations that excluded. They, they agreed to have a, a gender perspective issues in adaptation, not mitigation of technology. Those are serious issues. Just gender in adaptation, loss and damage, but human rights uh, nowhere. Just in the preamble, as uh, human rights and the Pachamama are included in the preamble of the of the Paris Agreement. Why? Well, I'm not a social scientist. I don't understand why countries don't include human rights in the climate change negotiations. For me, it's difficult to understand. I, I don't understand. Perhaps Erin could help us. <laughs> I'm not going to offer an answer. Nicole, did you wanna did you wanna offer some reflections, maybe? Oh, I don't think I have a real <clears throat> I don't have an uh, hold on one second. Oh. Okay. Um I don't have a real answer. I think that it de totally depends on the socio-political dynamics of a context that I'm not familiar with, but at a very basic level, the answer is power. <laughs> power mm -hmm. over other people and um, exclusion. <clears throat> yes. Yes, I remember at, at, at the end when we really lost it, we only supported by Norway and Norway proposed, uh, let's uh, include human rights, uh, depending on the definition of your country, <laughs> how each country defines human rights. Of course, we didn't want it, but we struggled for it. But for me, it was uh, amazing. So I didn't even say, well, why do you include w women and or gender and you don't include <laughs> human rights? Mm -hmm. I'm curious, so, but it's difficult. Yeah, go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, so I think, um, well, human rights, I mean, it's a legal framework that technically includes responsibilities. And so there are all the politics of responsibilities that never yeah. get implemented. And there's also, there also may be some internal UN politics, because uh -huh. the UN agency that's taken the lead on the human right to food is FAO. And they've actually created a whole platform and, and dashboard for looking up all the possibly right to food related mm -hmm. stuff. So maybe there's also internal UN politics on this. Oh. Yes, it might be, yes. Go ahead, Park. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Nicole's answer is the heart of it, that, that, you know, there's reasons why people in power don't want human rights. But I just want to say a slightly more sympathetic spin that one could say is that the people responsible for climate negotiations wanted it not to get caught up in great power politics. So they wanted it mm. to be something that every power from uh, states mm. and nations all over the world could 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 study the principles without worrying about, is this benefiting Russia at the expense of China, China at the expense of the US, or the US at the expense of yeah. somebody mm -hmm. else? And so I think that was probably uh, part of the logic for some people. Yeah. Uh, well, that might be, yes. Yes, yes. I have questions yes, also because, you know, there's the question of language in these big agreements, and there's the question of what actually happens on the ground and what influences what. Uh, so remains to be seen when we go with this. With that, maybe we thank Dave. Thank you so much for coming. It was really great to have this oh, discussion, and I appreciate the dialogue. Much. That was awesome. And um, so thank you for all your efforts and your inspiration across the board from physics of the atmosphere all the way to, <laughs> to work with people to to uh, anticipate crop failure. So thank you, thank you. And we look forward to being in touch. Thank you very much. I wanted to discuss a lot of with you. So I think we achieved that.
I understand and see your point of views and so so thank you very much to all of you bye-bye bye-bye